welcome back to part two of our debate tonight on healing where the subject is is the gift of healing for today mediating is tim vince and either side of him are dr michael brown and dr james white and for the last hour they've had the opportunity of putting some of the arguments putting some of the points concerning scripture on this important subject now it's your opportunity to come back to them and say your points and ask them questions and already many of you have been doing that with emails and texts and twitters that tweets that have come in we're going to be also opening the phone lines and there'll be an opportunity if you ring for some of you to be able to speak to them direct and ask them for your question let me just say uh, some of the tweets that have come in. Uh, Brent, he wrote and said, great opening statement. David Betts said a similar thing. He says, these are two of the best opening statements I've ever heard. Well done. And uh, um, Honoria Latin said, Ephesians 4 is so misunderstood. So misunderstood. As you can imagine, lots of you have got comments on the things that we're discussing tonight. Um, Kaz La Vida said, he is, in a, he is in in us both to will and to work. It is God who does the healing and not us. He still heals, but according to his grace, not according to our desires. And Joan wrote and said that the last debate, she agreed uh, with Dr. Michael, concerning uh, the things to do with predestination. But tonight, she's in agreement with Dr. James regarding healing. She says, as I too have seen miraculous healings, but I've also sat at the bedside of godly people who love God, who did not get healed. Now to some of the questions that have been coming in. Quite a number are coming in and saying, how is it that we do seem to hear of genuine healings through the Lord Jesus Christ in more simple, less materialistic societies than our own, says uh, Rebecca. And a similar theme is in a uh, text that has come in from Mike, who says, um, why is it that the poor are more receptive to healing than the rich, e.g. the reports of healings are far more widespread in Africa than in many Western nations? And uh, her question is, why, um, Mike's question, sorry, my question is when Jesus said greater works than these will be done, what did he mean? And just one more question from Carl um, in Spain. He says, Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It's often quoted when discussing this subject to defend the continuing nature of apostolic or otherwise miraculous healing. And uh, particularly, Dr. White, doesn't this contradict your position? If not, what does it mean? Tim, there are just a few of the points. Oh, back to you. Okay, I think I've noted them all down. And even during the break, we had some other questions to add to it. Um, Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Going James. with the last one first. Huh? Absolutely. Uh, recognizing my memory is not good enough to remember <laughs> it after that. Anyway, sorry. Okay. Uh, you know, interestingly. And greater, let's go for the other one as well. Greater works than these shall be done. Oh, okay. Just add to it. To yeah. it. Um, Saying that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever does not mean that Jesus Christ is going to do everything the same way that he's always done it in the past. Uh, again, I think this is a, just a, a false assumption. The text isn't talking about that. In fact, in the context, it, the very next verse is, do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which uh, I would apply to a lot of word faith teachers, interestingly enough. But saying that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever is talking about his nature. Uh, not how he's dealt with people, because the reality is Jesus dealt with his people in one way under the Old Covenant, a different way under the New Covenant. And so you could destroy all distinctions in the way that God has dealt with his people by quoting that text and saying, well, he always has to do it through the use of the law or through Sabbath observances or whatever else. Uh, that obviously is not what the writer to the Hebrews is talking about there. And when we talk about John chapter 14, and I'm glad the question was brought up because I kept putting in my notes and then uh, time wouldn't allow me to get to it. Um, interestingly enough, John 14 through 16 is the section where Jesus is talking about the coming of the Spirit. Uh, the first application of everything in that text has to be to the apostles themselves immediately. Then you have to be very careful in making application beyond that to those who believe because of their message, that is, to the rest of the church. But when you talk about greater things, what greater things did, uh, is ever recorded in the New Testament that the apostles did than Jesus did. 
I mean, that's a question everybody has to answer. If you're going to say greater things than Jesus did, Jesus raised the dead, uh, Jesus did all sorts of these things, and when we look at any of the things that the apostles did, uh, they don't seem to eclipse in any way the mir miracles of Jesus. So what is that text talking about? I would like to suggest, and I think most people outside of Western cultures automatically sort of gather onto this, uh, and, this is, and I say this with all seriousness, that the perseverance under trial, persecution, and suffering that has been seen in the saints of God down through the ages, whereby they are conformed to the image of Christ. They die to self. They die to this world. They put to death their members and become like the very Son of God because of their union with Him is the greatest miracle that has ever taken place. It involves the incarnation of the Son of God. It involves His sacrifice on the cross. It involves the ministry of the Spirit of God in our lives. That is the greatest miracle that could possibly ever take place. And I think we have to consider those as possibilities because the Bible itself does not record for us the, the apostles doing anything more uh, than what Jesus did in that way. So I don't think it is greater in the sense of flashier. I think it is greater in the sense of its enduring effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, because Lazarus, ra risen from the dead, thank, thank the Lord, he died later. Yeah. And so it is, it is the endurance that makes it greater. Brilliant. And, and the Lord did say to Thomas, um, you know, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Mm -hmm. you know, and Thomas had to see um, the, the risen Lord. And maybe you don't necessarily have to see to believe. But um, uh, other uh, questions are here. Now, I, I note that you can, you can give empirical examples from both sides um, but the lady who said uh, about you know illness by the bedside I want to bring this forward as it were before we go to the other two questions we were talking in the break uh, uh, about you know what do you do with someone who's in need of surgery mm -hmm. and Jehovah's Witness and, witnesses and the parents you know who won't allow their children to have a blood transfusion comes to mind what does a faith you know ministry do in that situation sure uh, let me just say in very brief response yeah. Yeah, sure. to the previous yeah. points and then to come to that specific question. Although I agree exegetically Hebrews 13.8 is not primarily making a statement about whether to expect healing, I think it's only natural when people read the Gospels and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's the will of God in action. He's moved by compassion that we can really expect to see similar things happening. And then John 14 I look at this in the larger context of the chapters there. John 15 is one of the most important personal verses we all take in terms of abiding in the vine, surely not just for the apostles. And whosoever believes, whoever believes the Greek has used that exact same phrase a number of times in John's gospel. It's always universal. As for greater works, Acts 2, let's start there. 3,000 converted and added to the body in a single day after a single message. That never happened in the ministry of Jesus. That would be one example right there. But, but as far as... Just on his other example, that, you know, how great it is that people can endure. Well, it, 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 it is Lord wonderful. It's a great, great testimony to, to God's uh, power in a human being. And, and it's clearly by his grace that people do it, not by their own strength. I don't see that in terms of the greater works, that vocabulary of works, the way it's used, even in the very previous verse or elsewhere in John 10. I don't see it referring to that. There does not seem to be a work there. So I agree it's a great demonstration of grace. We've worked with persecuted Christians and had friends martyred for the gospel. So we, we take our hats off to them. I just wouldn't see that specifically as what Jesus is saying. But, but as far as uh, someone comes down gravely ill, F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth, who was a mentor to A.W. Tozer, said that, that if sickness is being sent by God, and he's afflicting people with sickness, then doctors and hospitals and nurses are in rebellion against his will because they're trying to get rid of the will of God from people's lives. Rather, if we look at sickness as an affliction, as an attack, as part of being in a fallen world, then doctors are on God's side as ministers of healing. Even with God saying, on the in Exodus 15, 26, I'm the Lord your healer, we see in Exodus 21 of two men fight and, and, and there's an injury that the other man has to see that the person is thoroughly healed, which has normally been taken to mean pay the physician's fee. 
the we see it the, the yeah, yeah. yeah so we see in, in Jeremiah the eighth chapter the prophet saying is is there no physician there is there no balm in Gilead we see in Isaiah 1 that there's simple treatment pouring wine in wounds or setting of bones or things like that Luke the doctor in the New Testament Paul's advice to Timothy so I look at medical science as a gift from God on the same side when it comes to King Asa whose name is short most likely for Asael or Asael, which would be Yahweh healed or, or God healed, we see in, in first, Second Chronicles 14 and 15 that he moved the nation to seek God. He was attacked in an overwhelming way. It looked hopeless. He cried out to God. God delivered him. The same thing happens in the 16th chapter. Instead of looking to God, he looks to the arm of flesh. The prophet comes and rebukes him. He throws the guy in prison. Then he gets terribly ill. So he has been known for seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord, seeking the Lord. Now instead he leans on the arm of flesh. And even in his severe illness, he doesn't seek the Lord, but rather consults with physicians, which I understand the Hebrew idiom to mean consulted with pagan physicians. So his sin was not trusting in God. It is not a sin to go to doctors. Now, if God judged someone with sickness, because they, they were in sin and rebellion, and that person, rather than humbling themselves and praying, went to a witch doctor, that would be the equivalent of what Asa did. But for a Christian to say, God's on the side of healing and health, therefore medical science is a good thing, wonderful. However, I'd also agree with what James said, our tendency to immediately go to the, to the bottle, to the medicine, to the doctor, is something that many don't have as an alternative, which is why many people in poorer countries, they recognize their need, they don't have access to doctors, they're much quicker to lean on the Lord and trust Him. We can be so quick to go to doctors, but by all means, thank God for medical science, it's on the side of healing, it's on God's side. Right. I didn't think we'd get those other uh, questions answered, but that's the, the skill of our folk here in the studio. We'll go back to Gordon for emails, texts, Twitters. Tim, thanks so much. As you can imagine, quite a number of people are writing in and talking about the miraculous healing that they've experienced. Don't intend to read all of them, but let me just read one. This is from Gay, who says, I was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism for over 21 years, also had a viral infection, kidney stones, and cyst in my left ovary. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and last year, by the blood of Jesus, I'm healed completely. She says, I totally embrace, believe and receive. I am the Lord that healeth thee, Exodus 15, 26. So thank you for, for all of you who are writing in with such testimonies as that. Facebook is being busy, Tim. Uh, Margaret on Facebook says, I believe God heals through prayer and faith, but the gift of healing stopped with the apostles. Whilst Angela says, we can only pray, thy will be done. But Chris, on the other hand, says there are so many reports of Jesus healing throughout the world, even people being raised from the dead. So I'm sure the gift of healing is still for today. Now, let me just put some questions that have come in. This is from Peter, who thanks us at Revelation for organizing the debate. And he says, you often hear Christians, including, he says, some people on Revelation TV, quoting verses like Isaiah 53, verse 5, and 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes we're healed, and relating it to sickness. And he's saying, uh, could our panel say, do these verses refer exclusively to physical healing, or are they to do with Christ's work um, in redemption? A very simple one-liner uh, text here, which says 1 John 5, verses 14 to 15, is the most clear instruction that we need to understand healing. And Bernard says, keep it simple. And if I ask you one more, how's this one for, um, it's for Dr. White. And it says, I would like to ask Dr. White whether he will pray for the sick for divine healing, like it happened at the beautiful gate in Acts 3. And on what basis will he do it, um, if he will? Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, now, is it fair to go straight to you, <laughs> James, because I went to you last time? I don't think they were quite listening to your opening statement, but um, uh, Isaiah 53 mm -hmm. and 1 Peter 2, verse 24. Sure. Uh, I focused on this in my doctoral dissertation. First, let me give the simple answer and, and then the more in-depth answer. First Peter 2 is, is primarily emphasizing spiritual healing. You were like sheep going astray. You've returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls by whose wounds you were healed. The emphasis there is on spiritual healing. 
what I would say is the, the prophetic vision was the whole person wholly healed. That there was not this strict dichotomy that made between physical healing and spiritual healing. And that was the vision of the prophets. Therefore, the language is carrying sickness and pain, which would, which would not be exclusively taken in a spiritual way. What's interesting is that Isaiah 53 is quoted in Matthew 8, Matthew 8, 16 and 17, that Jesus drives out demons and heals the sick to fulfill what was written in Isaiah 53, surely he's borne our sicknesses, carried our pains. But when you look at that passage in Isaiah 53, he was carrying our sicknesses and pains when he hung on the cross. So how does Matthew quote it there? Matthew looks at the whole of Jesus' ministry in a vicarious way that he enters into our world and takes on his shoulders our suffering, our pain, until he goes to the root of all human suffering, namely sin, and nails it to the cross. As a result of that, as the benefits of the cross make their way in our lives, the ultimate benefits are in eternity. But many do come our way, not just with spiritual healing, but with physical healing and deliverance as well. So I see Isaiah 53 as broader, the, the whole man wholly healed, the application in 1 Peter 2, focusing on spiritual healing. Okay. Could I ask, yes, uh, could yes. I, could I ask yeah. a, a follow-up on that, however? Yeah. Uh, real practical application here. Uh, perfectly agreed, 1 Peter uh, 2, uh, very spiritual application, salvation, et cetera, et cetera. I had this happen as a, as a chaplain, and so I want to know how you would respond to this. I know how I responded to it, obviously, but people who have heard a teaching that uh, healing is in the atonement, it is always God's will, et cetera, et cetera, what about the person who hears that message, they hear the message to repent and to believe, and they assume that because of that, to truly believe in Jesus means you must experience healing, mm -hmm. and yet they have some, some disease, they don't experience that, and therefore cannot believe that they've actually experienced salvation as well. What do you say to them from your perspective? Yeah, very important question, and, and I think we have to be very diligent when we speak about healing, to minister to, to all the needs and to speak to those who are not healed and to encourage faith in the midst of, of suffering. What I, what, what I proclaim loudly and clearly in the gospel is that Jesus came to save us from our sins, that Jesus came to deliver us from, from guilt and, and from our destructive life so that we now live a life in obedience to God. That's the gospel. That's the fundamental purpose of the cross. That's what happens when we repent and believe forgiveness of sins, a new life and obedience to the Lord. I see there are benefits that accrue to us through the cross. I, I see uh, redemption and restoration and salvation as, as all part of the same wonderful stream, even with the word sozo, which Luke uses in just a couple of chapters for forgiveness of sins, deliverance from demons, raising from the dead and healing of the sick. So he is the savior from all these different situations. So I would clearly distinguish forgiveness of sins from everything else and then say the benefits of the cross can be accrued to us by faith. For example, there are, there are people who are mentally disturbed and through relationship with God and peace coming, they, they're actually delivered from that. There are people, we hear it all the time, especially evangelism in third world countries, as people cry out to Jesus for salvation, they find themselves healed. But I would say the one thing is the guaranteed result of the cross that everyone experiences in this life and there are benefits that, that we can experience. I see it all purchased there and available through there, but I would make that distinction. And if anyone had that way of thinking that, well, if I'm not healed or if I'm not saved, I'd immediately cut that right at the root. Okay, James, just so that I'm consistent, the last question that came through, uh, you know, would you pray for the sick as in Acts 3? And I uh, would uh, also just a comment on gaze healing, you know, th this, is there a principle there that, uh, do you remember Gay, um, Gay. Um, she, she was said she was completely healed, oh, you know, sorry. if you believe and receive, I'd like you, you know, to comment on in, that. In, in answer to the first question, again, the normative uh, context in the New Testament is, um, I'm an elder in a church, therefore members of my church, we pray for them in accordance with Jacob 5. Um, I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to give points. Uh, you got Jacob. Okay. say Jacob. Uh, uh, Jacob, yes, uh, of course. But, uh, of course. Jacob, since, <laughs> since we use other English names, Jacob is good enough. See, he, he disagreed with you there. I got you, got you from the other side. But anyways, um, we do, uh, obviously, I, I told the story of the fact that we prayed for the healing. Uh, we have an, another individual in our congregation who was healed after about 10 or 11 years of constant prayer for her in a chronic situation. Obviously, I would make a distinction with the Acts 3 because we're talking about apostle here and I don't claim to be an apostle, I claim to be an elder. 
Uh, so there, I see a distinction between the two. Um, but one of the things that immediately crossed my mind when that uh, when email was read yeah. was what does, and this is one of the reasons I asked the question I did, what does someone else with the exact same physical ailment listening in the audience think when they have in faith prayed for deliverance and have not been? That is one of the things that concerns me about our discussion. And from my perspective, this is where the freedom of God, and this is where we have a difference, uh, working out his will to sanctify each of his children in the way that he chooses. I, I look at, there's a lady in our congregation that's, that, that suffers from, from migraine headaches. I've had a few of those things in my life. And my goodness, I don't think I could be the way she is and function the way she does if I had that kind of, I just, I, call me a wimp if you want, um, but I just don't know how I could do that. And God has not yet chosen to free her despite the prayers of all of the saints for her. Um, if she hears someone who is freed from that, what is, the, what, is the, what is the result of that? If you don't have that concept that God is free to sanctify his children as he chooses to do you so. You know, the thing that's interesting. Right, we yeah. have someone on the line, so we'll, we'll come back to that. So, okay. Doug, because I have actually waited. I tried not to interrupt you on right. what you had to say, but Douglas, thank you for your patience, and uh, uh, please put your question to our guests. Uh, thank you very much. Um, congratulations on a really helpful debate so far. Um, my question is for Dr. Brown, and as to do with the Book of Acts, it was mentioned in passing that um, what we see in the Book of Acts is not the apostles just doing here, but it's part of regular body life. So my question is, how are we to view the Book of Acts? Is the Book of Acts a transitional book showing us what's happening in the um, early church, or is it a blueprint for how church life is supposed to be down through the ages? Uh, it's, it's both. In, in other words, there are things that are there in, in terms of our sense of community, in terms of our expectation of the power of God coming, in terms of the gospel coming with power to bring conversion of individuals and masses, that should be normative. We should be seeing that as the gospel continues to spread around the world. And in point of fact, in many parts of the world as the gospel is spreading, the stories sound very reminiscent of the book of Acts. As far as further blueprint though, that's where we have to go to the parts of the New Testament that are specifically meant as a blueprint. So we want to see what worship services should be like or gatherings. Well, well, Paul tells us about that in 1 Corinthians 14. We want to see about the ongoing operation of the Spirit in our midst. We go there 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. We want to understand other things about, about church order and ministry requirements. We go to the pastoral letters. Uh, so we, we want to take in the whole testimony of the New Testament. So we know certain things in Acts are unique and there is a certain establishing and there is a first a uh, first generation witness that's unique, but other things in terms of God's ongoing presence and power and transformation of lives should be normative. And when we read that, it often drives me to my knees to say, Lord, where's the power of the gospel? When we speak the word, where's the convicting power? Where's our dedication and prayer? Even the idea that there's often persecution for the faith, we see that through the New Testament, but Acts is telling us, as Jesus often did, that it would be normative. So there are aspects of it that are transitional, that are foundational, there are other aspects which are to be continued, and then we see how the whole thing is fleshed out in other parts of the New Testament. James, anything to add on that? I want to ask a further question. Uh, I'm actually giving my opponent more time by asking questions, but, but this, is so, this is so important to me. You and I um, have both entered into the fray and the battle in standing for godliness in Western culture that seems to be absolutely in love with death and absolutely in love with anything that is opposed to God and to his ways, especially in regards to marriage and sexuality. Both of us have done that. Uh, would love to have the opportunity of doing it with you at some point in the future. But here's my question. Do you, see, you, you just used the term normative. And yet we live in a culture that I think you would agree is under the judgment of God for its love of self and sin and its rejection of a tremendous amount of light. Would you see that there would be something different in regards to the ministry of the Spirit and in what we would expect to see as the result of our preaching in a land that is under judgment over against a land where the gospel is going forth, deliverance is taking place from false idols and religions, you know, on the cusp of where the church is growing. 
Could you see that there would be a difference in what the normative experience of the church would be here in a land under judgment over against that other context? Uh, yes and no. The idea questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes and no. Yes, for sure, and that there are different contexts, and, and God does pour out his grace in certain ways where the gospel is first going and being established, and, and the false gods are being destroyed, and, and, and false ideologies demolished. Uh, and, and yes, I could see us bringing a prophetic witness of warning, uh, followed by judgment. I could see that happening. At the same time, I want to be a man full of the Spirit. I want to be a man that when I'm speaking, it's more than just my words. I, I, I want it to be as we're speaking for righteousness. It's not just I have a political conservative view. Okay. So on that level, I, that's what I want to see normative in that sense. But will I expect to just say in, in, at, at any given meeting, I'm going to lay hands on the sick now, they're going to be healed, and that's going to be a sign. There is a context for everything. But I would love to see at the end of a, of a debate, say, on redefining marriage at a university, that people come up and say, I, I'm undone, I'm shaken, uh, something's the matter, and, and God manifesting his power in that way. Um, just to say, Douglas, thank you very much for your um, phone call and your question. Uh, we'll go back to Gordon now for some more of your messages. Tim, thank you so much. Emails and texts are simply flooding in, as you can imagine. And I'll just give you a flavour. So many questions. We could be going on, I think, for a few hours tonight. Alex writes and says, Mark 11.24 tells me that whatsoever you ask in prayer. And Alex says, whatsoever includes healing. And uh, Alex talks about somebody called Kenneth Haggins, who got a revelation of this verse and received his healing. He'd be interested to know what the panel think. And then talking about healing today and the gift of healing, uh, I guess this one's particularly towards Dr. Michael Brown. Uh, Tim is asking the question, why is it, if the gift of healing is in the church, that the survival rate for cancer, and similar such illnesses are no better for Christians than atheists or followers of other faith. Somebody called Governor Hammond has written and said, Dr. James claims he's witnessed people who've had a lot of faith but were not healed. He says, I would like to know upon which basis does he measure the level of faith of these people? How does he know whether these people have faith? In our own eyes, we could think we have faith, but in God's eyes, they don't. Tim, back to you. Thank you. Uh, three really good questions there. I want to slightly interject with um, this. I can see some crossover because um, James has asked a few times about yeah. acknowledging that it's God's will. In an instance where someone is not healed, you'll say it's God's will. I don't know. I, why go to the doctor then to try to get God's will off of that person? If I've concluded it's God's will for them to be sick, why get any medical care? So, I, no, I've not concluded that. Be, because in the extreme case of a faith, someone who's got a great ministry in healing, I, they I die don't, of, I don't, of an illness that uh, okay. everyone's prayed for them to be healed. I don't know what's happening behind the scenes, and it's wrong for me to make judgment. The book of Job makes clear that when you see suffering, don't change your view of the person and say, well, you must be a sinner, and then don't change your view of God and say, well, God must have sent it. Because neither of those I'm things were right, right, right. But, right. but, but let, let me say this yeah. about sickness yeah. uh, th that's really important here. Yeah. Uh, I know people who have grown in God through being sick. I know others who have been utterly destroyed and decimated, families decimated. One of my dear friends has been in a hellish battle with severe cancer for years now. He was on, his, on death's door numerous times. It's, it's a miracle he's even still alive, honestly. Uh, it, has, it has hindered him from touching so many people he wants to touch. It has been such a brutal trial. He loved Jesus before, he loves Jesus now. He was living a godly life before, he's living a godly life now. This thing has been a curse, not a blessing. That's how Jesus often treated it. Why didn't he just say to the multitudes that he was healing, hey, this is sent by God to sanctify you. I say God can work through all these things. Romans 8.28 is, mm -hmm. is true. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him. But can I, I just I, put this one back to James in terms of, you know, of sickness and illness? Mm -hmm. you, you could attribute that to the, the enemy of God. Well, the, the God always uses means, and we see in the book of Job that he uses means, but God is in control of these things. God has a, has a purpose. When, when Michael says, well, this is, this is a curse upon this person, if this person is a true believer, 
anything that touches their life, God has allowed to touch their life for a purpose. And we're already told what that purpose is. In Romans chapter 8, what? To conform us to the image of Christ. It's, it's like an illustration from Colossians 3. It says, you have died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. It's like I take my wedding ring here. You have died and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. Now I dare you to touch my wedding ring without going through those two hands. You can't do it. And so the great promise of sanctification for the believer is that no matter what happens to me, God has a purpose in it because it could not touch me given where my life is hidden were it not God's purpose that it touched me. Now the means by which it comes to me is always important. I mean, we've, we've made a distinction between someone who secretly begins to abuse drugs or something like that uh, while continuing to proclaim to be a Christian. We're not talking about those types of situations here. We're talking about people who can honestly look at their lives and say, other than the, the abiding sin that all of us experience in, in not having a full knowledge of God and things like that, there is not any particular th uh, sin that has brought this about. And yet, everything that happens to us, whether it is our blessing or whether it is our suffering, is designed by a loving Heavenly Father to conform us to the image of Christ. And we cannot look at somebody else and say, wow, God must love that person more than he loves me because they, he's blessed them with health and the ability to do all these things and I haven't gotten that, therefore there must be a difference in God's love. That's where I say there's the massive can, can difference. Can I ask James a, qu a question? Yes, you can. I've uh, asked you, why not? Yeah, yeah, I mean, when I think of that woman gay that called in, yeah. yes, I'm thinking about the person that says, well, I love God and I have those same conditions and I'm not healed, but I'm also thinking about the person that heard it and faith came alive and for the first time they realized, I could be healed. I've just thought God sent this to me for some reason. I could be healed and they get healed as a result of it. But if everything that comes my way is sent by God, then how do you deal with Ephesians 6 and spiritual warfare and 1 Peter 5, resist the devil, and, and Jacob, the fourth chapter, uh, where, where we're told to resist the evil one. There is attack. There are things that come. Paul said he wanted to go to the Thessalonians, and, and Satan hindered him. I'm not to receive everything Satan sends my way, and there are things sent by Satan. Jesus sent his disciples out to heal the sick, drive out demons. There was authority given, recognizing that these very were intrusions. Question. Very long question. Yeah. We've got so, James on the line. But a very simple response. Okay. Joseph learned the answer a long, long time ago. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. God has to restrain his brothers from killing him. He is falsely accused, put in prison, forgotten while in prison, all the rest of those things. And in that suffering that was his, that unjust suffering that was his, there is a man who learned that his God loved him despite all the context around him and eventually delivered him from all those things. He saw that they were means that God used. My answer to you is Satan, we resist Satan, we fight against Satan, not because he's an extra power outside of God. He is under God's control. He cannot do anything that God does not allow him to do. But we are called out of our love to God to fight for what is good, to fight for what is honoring to him. And the only reason that that would be a problem for a reformed person like me is if you assume that we have to have a knowledge of every element of God's decree and act upon that, which we do not. Correct. We are given his prescriptive will in his law, which says to do what is right. Okay. Um, we haven't answered the questions from the emails, but James from Birmingham, welcome to the program. I'm far away. Uh, good evening. I'm very interested to hear what's been told about the, um, the perfect will of God. Uh, I had schizophrenia for 26 years before the Lord Jesus enabled me to uh, deliver myself. And um, I believe that I could have come out of this uh, condition very much sooner had there been uh, an insistence by brothers and sisters to pray me through. But I do believe in all this that the perfect will of God to keep me in that prison house for 26 years was something he wanted to do to give me treasures in darkness that I may then go on to help other people with the same condition. So I want to just mention to our dear brethren that the church needs to rise up to see that there is uh, healing through deliverance. We have not really got a hold of this. There are many people who need healing who are sick in their minds and, and in their spirits, and they need actually deliverance to bring about the healing. But I take on board what you say about the perfect will of God. I'm happy that I lost 26 years, that God could actually feed into my heart a vision of himself and a compassion 
for those who have the same condition that I had. Thank you very much. There's, there's, there's some real depth in that question. I want to put that to Michael again in yeah. terms of you know, the Lord taking quite a long time in, in healing. Yeah, again, I, I can base nothing in terms of theology on her experience except to say it reaffirms that whatever is meant for evil or destruction, God can use for good. Uh, did he will the 26 years? James would say yes. I would say I don't know, but he worked through it. There are many things that happen in Scripture God said he was against or not pleased with. The reason the Corinthians were sick and some died was because of disobedience, not because of a divine decree, and they were told to repent and, and there would be life and healing. But in this case, I rejoice that this dear saint of God has grown and learned things that only could have been learned through that. That's the mystery of, of redemption. The cross in itself is a terrible thing, but it's what God used to save. And, and then with that, the revelation that we do have authority in Jesus, that there is a time when we stand up and, and we, we say no. Uh, I, I was wondering though, if the, the question about how come there's not more healing and why is our survival right, rate with that, cancer? We, we can go, yeah, we can just, go just, that. just that's uh, statistics, but let's go, yeah, just go down that. Just address that quickly. Yeah. I've written, I wrote in 1991 a book called Whatever Happened to the Power of God is the Charismatic Church Slain in the Spirit or Down for the Count, saying that we should be seeing much more happening, that we're only seeing a fraction of what we're supposed to. I believe one reason for that is our general distance from God and, and our lack of faith and obedience. I believe another thing could be the way we take care of ourselves. If, if I, I need to lose some weight, get in better shape, I can't expect God to miraculously make up the difference. And then in our own midst, where we're, we're not dependent on, on miracles and we're dependent on medical science and we go there so quickly, I think there's often something in our mentality. I would say this, if you'll go to, to third world countries where it's either the witch doctor or Jesus, you'll see the people going to Jesus are getting healed and living much healthier lives than the ones going to yeah, the witch and, doctor. And, and also, I think statistically, we've had, we've had doctors here who've done the studies. Statistically, if those that are of faith communities, the stats are much better. Yeah, they actually just, are. It's a right, fact. In general, those being prayed for in hospitals, etc. Yeah, and um, living by uh, the word. Just um, ticking off the list now. Um, whatsoever you ask in my name, Matthew 11, uh, 24, and and how do you measure the level of faith? They were the earlier email Oh, questions. they were, yeah. And I really wanted to get to that second one because uh, obviously I believe asking anything in Christ's name is asking according to the will of God because that's even what Jesus Christ himself did. And that requires self-denial, taking up the cross, um, and, and really the reason that what we ask in Christ's name comes to, play, comes to pass is because we have become so much one with the will of God. Uh, and so much of that, of that teaching of that text is for you to get your desires rather than for you to be made in the image of Christ and therefore your will and God's will are, 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 are one thing. That's why you see those things happening. But the second one's really what got me. Um, and that is, you say that these, these people who have endured uh, for so long, how do you know that they really do have faith? And I was, I was taken aback by the question, quite honestly, because it's not that I am somehow a, a given a divine ability to detect faith. These are individuals who in the midst of severe trial and, and severe difficulty continue to glorify Jesus Christ, continue in the faith. They do not complain against God and uh, question His goodness. And I would submit that someone who endures patiently the suffering that these individuals have endured. I'm thinking of one particular individual who ran a website for Reformed Baptists. He did the work in a chair using a blowpipe. All he could move was his mouth. And he ran this website and a mail server for Reformed Baptists to share our prayer requests amongst our churches using a, all he could do is use a blowpipe, blowpipe to, to do this. And I look at someone like that, and I, I, I know a number of people like this. I wish I had their faith. I wish I had their acceptance of God's providence in their life and their love for Christ and the fact that they have been, uh, you know, it, when we get to heaven, it's almost Joe, I'm not gonna, uh, like. when they get to heaven, I'm not gonna see them because I'm gonna be too far back mm -hmm. and they're gonna be too far forward. Um, in the throng around the throne. Um, you measure that faith by the godly life that they live. 
And so many are so quick to, pro to protest against God's goodness and question God's goodness. And when someone can go through that and not question God's goodness and revel in his love, um, I don't know what you call it, but I call it faith. Call it Job. <laughs> um, uh, Gordon, uh, tweets, texts, emails. Yep, lots and lots coming in. The tweets are certainly active tonight. Uh, Kofi believes that Dr. Brown's just dancing around the question that he asked. Kyle says, if it's the will of God to be sick, don't go to the doctors. Aaron says, I don't think there are healers in the church like Dr. Uh, like Dr. White. It's clear God chooses to heal whoever he chooses. Matthew says to believe the Lord is, st he believes the Lord still heals, but it's got nothing to do with the gift of healing. And Kyle says we serve a living God and from Genesis to Revelation, we see him healing the sick through the prayers of his people. JT says healing in the Bible is always a gift to the recipient never teaches was a class of men who are healers. And if you wanted one question from this section, Tim, it would be the whole point of if specific people have a gift of healing, where do we put in the question, of the point that the Bible talks about of laying on of hands? Where does that fit in uh, in the context of healing? Very much. Just quickly write that down. Um, I want to go to one of my questions first on, uh, you know, is, is, is there a difference between suffering for the Lord's sake, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my mm -hmm. name's sake, and suffering? There can be overlap, for sure. We recognize there can be deprivation, torture, starvation, and imprisonment, and things like that, and physical sickness can come from it. But, but if, you, if you... Physical sickness, the fact that they're blessed for actually suffering. The, the, the New Testament statement repeatedly about suffering has to do with suffering for the gospel. I mean, if we had time, I'd go through almost every book of the New Testament and quote the verses that talk about persecution, opposition for the gospel. That's what we're to rejoice in. That's how the prophets were treated previously. Now look, if you go through the Psalms, you'll see the Psalmist crying out for healing and saying that when God forgave him, he was healed because sickness came as a punishment. We see sickness as a covenant curse in Deuteronomy 28, severe illnesses, not all sickness. But just but in this blessing element, the blessing for suffering for, uh, for, the, ne for the sake of the gospel. Right. If I I'm physically sick, if I get run down from overwork, that, that, that is not suffering on account of the gospel. If, if God forbid, I get in a car accident and I'll, I'm, I have to go through rehab, that hap this is the common lot of the human race. Now, there's blessedness on enduring it with a godly attitude. There's blessedness in the midst of trial to praise God, but the blessing for suffering, we misuse and misinterpret to say, well, I'm suffering for the gospel. That's why I have this, that's why I have that. No, that's the common lot of the human race or it could be specific satanic attack, a result of disobedience or not caring for ourselves. But Jesus is quite explicit when he pronounces the blessed words in Matthew 5, 10 through 12 and, and elsewhere through the gospels throughout the New Testament, suffering for the gospel is rejection, persecution, opposition because of our identification with Jesus. Okay. Um, the questions that came in, can way, you pick I, up? By the way, I yes, would have please. to agree that Pasco, generally, that is how it is utilized in, yeah. in the New Testament. Okay. You can make a very strong case yeah. for that. That's why I focused upon Paul's statement in regards to Asthenia and yeah. the connection with Timothy. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I was just trying to pick up that there was uh, sometimes a blessing, blessing, but I agree it's connected to, you know, for the sake of the gospel. Um, from the questions, have you got a good memory on the questions that came in? Well, on you know, emails? it's interesting. I, I, I actually wanted to try to uh, fix one of the statements because very quickly uh, someone on Twitter was quoted, I happen to have my, my phone, and okay. uh, so I saw the tweet. Yeah. It was Douglas who had called in. I happen to know who Douglas is in London. Yeah. Um, I jokingly say he actually lives in Indianapolis, but anyways. Yeah. Um, uh, what he was actually asking was a good question that maybe, maybe Michael yeah. could answer. And what he was saying is he had asked about if the New Testament is normative. In the tweet, he actually said, then where is the regulative principle as to how this activity is to be um, dealt with in the church? Where does the New Testament give us that future outlook as to how it's to be uh, regulated? And I would add to his question, because he wasn't just simply saying you were dancing around. He appreciated your response, but he was saying, this is, this is where I was going, and he didn't answer that part. And I would add to it, and I think this is a good, a good question to ask. 
since there isn't that there, isn't that why we have so many of the problems we have? I mean, so much of what you have to do to try to maintain your position is trying to have to distance yourself from the abuses that are there. But isn't it because we don't have anything in the New Testament that tells us this is how you're to regulate, this is how you're to recognize false healings from true healings and false healers from true healers and things like that? You, you see where the issue is? Yeah, I, I see the issue. My point would be that life in the spirit should be normative and that there's the other abuse of the lack of this, the lack of the presence of God in our, in our meetings, the, the lack of the manifestation of the gifts in our meetings, uh, having a form of godliness but denying its power in a slightly different context to use that. So the, the specific instructions we get, and I did answer it, are found in a passage like 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. It doesn't give every detail any more than we have every detail, think of this, of exactly what church leadership should look like. We've got a thousand different models for that. And then you have authority abuses because there's a certain flexibility that has to work across culture. But we should see in a normative way, prophecy, tongues, revelation, healing. And we should recognize that, that those that are used like this should have an outlet for their gifts. But the exact way, if I'm supposed to think that on, on a Tuesday at 8 a.m. this happens, and on a Wednesday at 7 p.m. this happens, that's beyond New Testament life well, in well, description. One thing that is very clear in the New Testament is it shouldn't be connected to money. And yes. you, know, you know, there are examples with Paul in Acts, you know, and then people who introduce destructive heresies because of their greed. And, and that's, and that's one that of the worst is, abuses. So the warnings are there, but maybe the more positive instructions aren't there. Well, Paul. honestly, I, I would follow up at, at that point because the, to, to make Corinth normative, I think, is, is a problem. I know you do that, and I think we, we disagree on this issue. Uh, because Corinth had some serious problems that the other, other churches did not have. So to make them normative at that point, but I, but I think the, the point from his perspective is when you look at the pastoral epistles where Paul is writing to the next generation, so we're looking beyond the apostolic period and looking at the next generation, there's nothing there about these very issues that cause us so much of a difficulty in being able to determine how these things are to be exercised. That's, I, that's I the issue just, I think he's raising. I see just as many issues, just in terms of ecclesiology, leadership, all the other things that you would say he addresses. I see constant conflicts, abuses, divisions within churches, how to do this, how to do that. But, but, but these, that's not these due to are a lack of scriptural teaching. It's due to very often an ignorance of uh, scriptural uh, teaching. Or, or a difference of interpretation of what we do with those particular scriptures. But I would point this out. Paul urges Timothy of, to fight the good fight based on the prophetic words given to him. Mm -hmm. Therefore, that's, that's an important matter, the ongoing gift of prophecy. He speaks of a gift that was given him through the laying on of hands. Now, I'm reading that in the next generation. I'm expecting his hands are laid on me. Gifts are going to be conferred. I'm looking for the gift of prophecy to operate. So because everything is not repeated, doesn't mean it's not normative. I still see, see these things as ongoing. They're taught elsewhere. He doesn't have to repeat everything. But it is definitely a pneumatic life that Paul speaks of in the pastorals. Okay, Joan, welcome to the debate. Hello. I just want to say that uh, I agree with Dr. Brown that healing is for today. God provided it. He provided for it, and it's written in James 5.13. But God has the prerogative to do as he wills, when he wills, how he wills, because he's God. And another thing I would like to stress is that Jesus said, I am come that they might have life, and life more abundantly. And sickness is not real abundant life. So God did make provision for sicknesses to be healed. And for Dr. James, he mentioned that God gave Paul a thorn in the flesh to humble him. God didn't give Paul that. It was a messenger from Satan to buffet him, but God used it for humbling Paul. And that's what I want to see. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think, James, could you want to answer that point about the messenger from Satan? Right. Uh, again, uh, I believe very firmly, I have to believe very firmly, that God uses means. And why would Satan do something to Paul to keep him from boasting. He wants Paul to boast. He wants to trip him up. Clearly, while it is a messenger from Satan to buffet him, 
here is one of those places where, as in Job, as in Genesis 50, as in uh, Isaiah chapter 10, as in Acts chapter 4, uh, and I'll just use Acts chapter 4 as a, as, a, as a perfect example, you have what we call compatibilism. That is, God's purpose in, and man's activities are brought together in Acts chapter 4, can I interrupt just to say that um, we'll, we'll be going into our closing statement. So after you finish this, I'm going to give you the close, the first closing statement. Well, I'll be very brief then, yeah. so we have plenty of time. Uh, in Acts chapter 4, uh, you have the church praying and recognizing that in the crucifixion of Jesus, you had Pilate, you had Herod, you had the Romans, you had the Jews, you had all these different people involved. And yet they did what God's purpose and had predestined to take place. And so Satan was the one that is used, uh, but that does not indicate that uh, he's outside of God's, God's control. Right, so just, just to say, we're gonna have two closing statements now. We're going to not get past an hour, a minute and a half, and then we'll go back to Gordon, but we'll start with James. Well, very briefly, I, first of all, I wanna thank Math, uh, uh, Matthew, hi Matthew, uh, Michael, for the, um, the spirit with which we've been able to do this. Um, we were talking during the break that this is a, subject that has tremendous pastoral implications to so many of the people in the audience that we can't even know. And so some of you may notice it seemed a little more um, aggressive last evening uh, than, than this evening, but I think it's because we both recognize uh, the audience and, and how it has to be handled, so I thank him for that. My bottom line, to, borrow, to steal a copyrighted phrase from Michael, uh, my bottom line is that God is free in the matter of healing. Uh, that he is the only healer that there is. Anyone who is healed is healed by God's power. Even if they're not a Christian, they owe God for the extension of grace that they receive. But the point is he does so freely and that there are times, uh, in fact, many times, where it is in the experience of weakness that his power is made full in us. And that weakness includes bodily weakness. And so if you as a Christian are suffering, do not question God's love for you. Uh, recognize that he will be with you even in the midst of that suffering. Uh, and that's my bottom line. Right, thank you. And, and John, oh sorry, James, <laughs> uh, thanks for your sensitivity as well, and Tim for hosting this. Uh, I, I affirm what James just said, no matter what you're going through, you need to be very conscious of God's love, and you need to be conscious of the fact that he can conform you to the image of Jesus through this. And I'm heartened by the fact that James said, yes, we pray for the sick, and, and yes, we've seen God heal. I wanna encourage you, to do that more. I want to encourage you to pray and ask God to heal with expectation. I'd review the fact that gifts of healing as spoken of in 1 Corinthians 12 are clearly something that God has deposited in the body that should continue right until the end of the age, that the breaking in of the kingdom brings with it healing and miracles, that Jesus is the will of God in living color, that God heals in his compassion, and that if you'll just do a study through scripture, read through the Bible repeatedly, and just look at what it says about sickness and healing, you'll see sickness in and of itself is a negative. God can work through it, but in and of itself it is a negative. Healing in and of itself is a positive, and God reveals himself to Israel as not I'm the Lord your smiter and sickness giver, but to his obedient people, I am the Lord your healer, and it's expressed through Jesus. Is God free to do whatever he wants? Of course he is, he's our sovereign God, but he's revealed his will in his word. Yeah, thank you very much. And I can just say it's been a great privilege just to be sitting, listening to you, making notes, and I look forward to going through them myself. And I hope you as the audience have also enjoyed um, this uh, very deep and special discussion on the gift of healing. So uh, I'm back, it's back to Gordon just to close out the show. Tim, I wanted to give a final word to our viewers. Dr. Mike, Pastor Mike, I should say, in Colorado says, thank you, Revelation TV, Dr. Brown and Dr. White for being willing to discuss these issues. It's very helpful and edifying. God does heal today. That's the amazing God that we serve. We hope that you'll be blessed and continue to grow in him. Thank you so much for watching our debate tonight. Thank you so much to our panel and especially to Dr. White and to Dr. Brown. Until the next time, thank you for being with us. God bless. Bye-bye. Well, I'm just being told we've got some more minutes. Let me just finish. I had one email that I wanted to share with you. It's this. It's from Lucinda. She says, hello. I remember reading Jennifer Reese Larkham, the woman who was healed after years in a wheelchair. And she said at the end of her books that she'd tried everything to get healed. But in the end, Jesus just healed her one day at a meeting. 
God heals, and I pray that he'll heal you of the sicknesses that you're from. Thank you for being with us. God bless. Bye-bye.